All right, let's uh, start bringing this meeting to order. We have quorum, so we can get started. Welcome everyone to the Planning and Strategic Initiatives Committee. We have uh, two items, and uh, we'll start off with the uh, uh, Community Climate Action Plan progress report. We have two delegations, and then um, uh, there's no presentation by staff. Could I have uh, Tova Davidson for Sustainable Waterloo Region, please? Welcome, Tova, and you have five minutes to make your delegation. Great, thank you so much. It's nice to be here and to see all of you today. I am Tova Davidson. I'm the Executive Director at Sustainable Waterloo Region, and I'm gonna use my five minutes to give you an update on what's been happening at Sustainable Waterloo Region as part of the frame of reference for the Climate Action Plan. You should all have a copy of our most recent year and report in front of you. Uh, you don't have one? I don't. Oh, it's a messy one. Okay. So, um, this year was a really successful year in Sustainable Waterloo Region's uh, history. Uh, one of the primary things that we did this year was transform our flagship program to be the Regional Sustainability Initiative. That transformation allows us to work with organizations, which is our mandate, organizational sustainability, in the areas of carbon, as we always have, but also in waste and water, as well as work with them to embed sustainability into business practices and policies. Um, so that program has been really great and we've had a really successful year. Um, we actually had our largest growth in our history, 14 new members last year. Our committed greenhouse gas reductions are over 52,000 tons um, and uh, the reductions to date are the equivalent of 9,517 cars off the road and that's with the business community in Waterloo Region. 93% of our pledging members, those who have committed to reducing their carbon waste or water are actually on track to meet their target and if you're interested in seeing how they're doing the center spread of the year and report actually has the report so if you open up the center spread you can see there are tables to track how are they doing against their targets TravelWise is a program that we offer in partnership with the region of Waterloo, and again, it's for organizations to help them um, reduce their number of employees that drive alone to work, and it, it meets the pain point often of tra traffic congestion, as well as parking, but also active and sustainable transportation. Uh, the TravelWise program has actually seen a mode split shift of 3% reduction of people driving alone to work from 2015 uh, to 2016, which is a massive shift for those who work in transportation management. The other piece is that they have collaboratively set a target for a 5% reduction by 2020. Climate Action, of course, is a program from all of Waterloo Region, which is run in partnership between Reap Green Solutions and Sustainable Waterloo Region. Um, this year, there was a re-inventory of the carbon emissions in Waterloo Region, um, and I'm not going to spill the beans because Danielle's here, and she's going to tell you how are we doing to date. Charge WR is also a program that we run, and Charge WR focuses on electric vehicle technology adoption. That includes charging stations and vehicles. Um, and there has been some really significant growth, as you can see from this table, which is also in the year-end report. We're up to 279 electric vehicles in the region, and there has been a commitment here to have over 1,000 by 2020, so we're on track to do that. And there are 43 publicly available charging ports, as well as many other charging ports that are privately available. So we've made some real progress in that as well. But the big thing that most people are aware of that we are working on is Evolve One, which is North America's first net positive multi-tenant office building, which we have a partnership with the CORA Group, the David Johnson Research and Technology Park, and EY Canada. We're working with them on building this building, which is the first of its kind. It will be net positive energy. It generates more energy than it uses. Um, and it is being built in the David Johnson Research and Tech Park, and these are pictures of what the building actually actually looks like. These are design drawings. Ground has already broken. The geothermal wells are dug um, and the foundation's being started right now. Some of the enabling features of that building are a photovoltaic uh, array, which is not only the entire roof of the building, but also more than half of the parking lot, 14 electric vehicle charging stations, and a geothermal exchange, which is really groundbreaking and not seen in many places across North America. 
The other piece that we're working on is the Innovation Hub, which is a ground floor hub to bring together the Accelerator Centre, Wilfrid Laurier University and UW, and then together to work to build the clean economy, fostering startups, research, not-for-profits and for-profit businesses to position Waterloo Region as leaders in sustainable business and the clean economy going forward. We were really excited to get funding for that innovation hub from the Trillium Foundation to the amount of $750,000 this year and we're in the process of working with both provincial and federal governments to um, support the development of this hub. I have 17 seconds left so I'll leave that with you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you Tova, that's uh, exciting stuff. Uh, there is a question, Councillor Fernandez. Well, not so much a question as, as expressing excitement about where we're going. And, um, but um, maybe I'll save this one for Danielle because you had the question in the Environmental Committee, so you might actually be able to answer it further. But Tova, um, this building that, that is, uh, is moving forward, such excitement in the environmental industry and, and you know, seeing that, car, that zero uh, yes. neutral. What's happening in this building? What is it going to be housing? I think that might be something that, that we want to also promote and, and, and tell people about. Mm -hmm. The building is meant to be a building that brings together core business. So EY Canada will be there. There's a company called Text Now that has taken some of the space, and then the ground floor is this innovation hub. But it is a business building. And the purpose of that building is not only to look at how do you reduce the emissions from business activity, but also how do you integrate a culture of sustainability so that the people operate in a way that allow the building to do what it's designed to do. So high performance buildings, which is what they call net positive, there are no net positive, net zero or now net positive buildings, never actually reach the capacity of what they're designed to be. So this building is actually engaging with researchers, a community behavioral psychologist from Laurier, to implement a behavior standard so that we can allow that building to be as sustainable as it's designed to be. And then that actually can be scaled in any building, anywhere to reduce the impact of the people and therefore reduce the impact of the business. So we're hoping to um, use this as an example for future buildings, yeah. but also not just in the building, but in, in the culture within the, uh, the, the staff, the employees who are in that building and how they can help um, offset or, or keep maintain that carbon neutral. Absolutely, and the purpose of this project is not to build one building. The purpose is scalability. So the building itself actually has a financially replicable model that the Cora Group feels is a good enough business case that they're willing to build more and more, actually already talking about building a second. The scalability of that behavior piece, as you talked about, and to reduce impact through how the people behave, and the scalability of that main floor innovation hub to allow for the startup and Canada's growth in the clean economy because our market share in that industry is actually reducing. Well, hopefully they'll look at a spot here in Kitchener. That's the hope and that they'll all be attracted to be here. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Marsh. Thank you, Tova, for your presentation. I'm just curious about a couple of things. One is the, how will the Innovation Hub complement or, or otherwise be different from our Innovation District here in Kitchener? So we're working really closely with Communitech, with Accelerator Center, with Catalyst, uh, with St. Paul's. So we're looking to complement the work that's already being done here instead of replacing any of it. Um, and what we're finding is that, for example, the Supercluster funding has just been announced, um, working with them to try to fill that gap. So Sustainable Waterloo Region won't run that hub. Accelerator Center will run the startup portion of that hub, hub because that's their expertise. And then the idea is that we partner in just as Accelerator Center partners in with the, re the regional innovation. It's the same idea. We are a piece of that larger cluster, so we all work together. Okay, great. And then um, you mentioned a target number of 1,000 electric vehicles yes. in 2020. So um, how are you collecting that data? How, people who privately purchase uh, an electric vehicle, do they, um, how do you learn that they have bought it? Uh, Ministry of Transportation can give us the numbers for how many vehicles are registered in the region. That's where we get that number from. Oh, I see. So we don't know who they are, but we know how many there are. Okay, thank you. Councillor Davey. Hey, thank you for coming in. Uh, great report. Just curious, you mentioned uh, in your presentation uh, the, the net positive building. Uh, you said some of the photovoltaic cells are in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. How is that structured? Like, are they overhead? They are. It's almost like a carport. So they are covered by the, um, the 
the solar panels, and then the cars will park underneath. Oh, so people even get to get into cooler cars than they would otherwise if it's a sunny day. Very good, thank you. And that's all the questions. Thank you, Tova. Thank you for coming. Next your is uh, Danielle. Danielle, thank you for being here. Again, you have five minutes. Perfect. Um, good afternoon, Chair Singh, Mayor Vervanovic, and members of Council. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Danielle, and I'm the Plan Manager of Climate Action Waterloo Region. So today I'm going to highlight some of the details which you have in our progress report um, and sharing how you can support our community to reduce greenhouse gas emissions now and into the future. So I'll share that there's over 300 communities across Canada who have developed their own community climate action plans. But our community's approach is unique because Climate Action Waterloo Region is a region-wide partnership and it's jointly led by two local nonprofits. Reap Green Solutions is an environmental charity that helps people live sustainably, and Sustainable Waterloo Region, as you heard from Tova, focuses on how organizations can reduce their environmental impact. In addition to being nonprofit-led, we work in direct partnership with the cities of Cambridge, Kitchener, Waterloo, as well as the Regional Municipality of Waterloo Region. Together, these partners aim to achieve a community-wide greenhouse gas reduction target of 6% below 2010 levels by 2020, while also supporting local economic development and a higher quality of life. This target, along with the Climate Action Plan for Waterloo Region, was unanimously approved back in 2013 by all three city councils as well as regional council. So Climate Action Waterloo Region's role in the community is to support the implementation of this plan through collaboration and community engagement. And we also me measure our progress towards that plan, which is a pretty big part of why I'm here today. So how are we doing? That's been the big question. Um, between 2010 and 2015, we reduced our carbon footprint from 4.6 million tons to 4.3 million tons, a reduction of 5.2%. That reduction also came during a time of population growth, growing by 5.7%, and an increase in the number of employees in Waterloo Region, a growth of 7.5%. And this does demonstrate that growth and reduction of emissions can actually go hand in hand. So this news is certainly something to celebrate, but there are major factors to consider when understanding our journey towards a low-carbon future. And the first of those factors is to consider the growth in transportation emissions, which now make up almost half of our community carbon footprint. This growth was caused by an increase in the number of vehicles in our community, and the growth in vehicles actually outpaced population growth, meaning that people who previously got around without a vehicle have since purchased a vehicle over the past five years. The second factor that is substantial is the decrease in the workplaces and homes emissions, which is due primarily to a major change in Ontario's electricity grid. So back in 2014, the provincial government completed a phase out of coal fired electricity generation. And this has made our electricity grid far less greenhouse gas intensive. So in fact, a kilowatt hour of electricity produced back in 2015 emitted almost three times less greenhouse gas emissions than a kilowatt produced in 2010. So without the phase out of coal, our community greenhouse gas emissions would have risen by 4.4%. So our progress so far needs to be considered in light of the significant impact that the phase out of coal has had on our local emissions. But we also must give due credit to the efforts that have been undertaken at a local level. To understand the, local role, the role local action played, we need to understand where we would be without it. So even back in 2013, we had pretty good policy signals that told us that coal would likely be phased out. So the blue line on this graph shows that even with coal phase out, local emissions were projected to grow by 1.1% 1 .1 by 2020. So it's local incremental action like those taken by everyday residents and business owners to conserve energy and community members who have changed the way they have gotten it around that helped us reduce energy use per person. So we can't expect another large change like we did with the coal-fired electricity generation. Um, so we now must turn our attention to fostering and supporting local reduction efforts. I think our report does a pretty good job of highlighting some of these amazing local actions, and I'm happy to answer questions about any of them that might need a little bit of help. So turning to the challenge ahead, this is our new community carbon footprint, and it represents our new challenge. 
Realizing a 5.2% reduction so far is good progress towards our 6% target, but we need to recognize the impact of coal and that it was a significant one-time event that can't be counted on again. And to see further reduction before 2020, we know that action will need to be accelerated at a local level, especially in the areas of transportation, and it will be up to each of us as citizens in our daily lives and as leaders within our organization to push, push for action. So with this report, Climate Action is issuing a call to action, and it concerns absolutely everyone in our community. To achieve our 6% reduction target and our future targets, we will require leadership and innovation to scale up existing solutions and implement new ones. Thank you. Danielle, um, you have some questions. Uh, Councilor Fernandez, go ahead. Thank you. And um, when it's appropriate, I'd like to move this item. Sure. So, Danielle, I know you had a few questions um, at the Environmental Committee, especially around the fact that the, with the coal plants closing, that we've, saw, we've seen that reduction. And you, you did say that you did take that into consideration when setting our target. Um, but should we, have, or should we have been more aggressive then? Because we, I mean, on your graph, you said we, we knew that was going to happen, but... By setting a, low, I mean, a lesser stringent target, we're kind of sort of saying, well, you know, we can pat ourselves on the back for something we haven't even done yet. So do you see that there was an opportunity that we could have set a higher target, or why did we not? I think the target we set was appropriate for the community at that time. Um, so we have to take into consideration that our community is growing, and it's growing rapidly. So at the time, our, our major goal was to set that first goal part post to come together that something was achievable, um, but still would require work both at a local level and some reliance on some items we expected to see from a federal and provincial level. And at this point, that's come to fruition, and we'll need to continue to uh, focus on that local action portion of it to actually reach the 6% at the 2020 timeframe. Right. So we've, we've got um, a shift in our waste management, and right now you're seeing, you're showing only 1% um, of, the, of our emissions are coming from our waste. Do you think that this shift, um, because, I mean, the, the region is, is saying all over the place that it's become more successful than they had expected, that that actually could have a greater impact on our emissions? Um, yeah, so as you noted, waste is 1% of the emissions, and we saw, I think it's an 11% increase over that five-year period in waste emissions. Certainly, um, waste diversion through the green, green bin program is the single um, uh, largest action that could reduce those emissions, and it could reduce it below 1%, possibly, um, but over the grand scheme of our footprint, we have to concentrate on other areas as well. Okay. So the other areas, of course, is our transportation. Um, where in, um, in the matrix and, and the way you looked at the challenges ahead does ION play in, into this? Um, so ION was considered when we originally built the climate action plan, um, and it's expected to be um, a significant contributor to reducing emissions in the transportation sector. Now, that is, of course, dependent on um, the community coming together and, and pushing to increase ridership in our local transit systems, not just ION, but the transit systems that feed mm -hmm. it, be it um, buses or active uh, transit trails and trips. Um, so really, that will come down to our community making um, personal changes and uh, us as municipalities and as supporting organizations to support residents in doing that. So how do we or can we break out um, the benefits of cycling into this? Um, as, we, as we grow our trails and we get, make things more connective, is, is there an opportunity for us because one of the things we hear quite often here at council is when we're adding bike lanes in or we're adding, you know, expanding trails that residents are saying, well, I don't see any cyclists. And then, you know, we do that. Do we do uh, some bike lanes and we do see more cyclists? Is there a way we can capture some of that um, increased um, activity at all? Um, 
I, over time, it would certainly be captured when we come back with the next progress report indicating if that transportation emissions have decreased. Um, so I suspect it would be reflected um, in those numbers um, and looking through to other organizations like the municipalities with their data sets and perhaps uh, travel wise with their measurements of how employees are commuting to work, looking for mode shift changes in each of those data sets to indicate that there has been a, a substantial change with um, these infrastructure pieces being put in place. Right. So uh, in comparison to other communities, um, we're uh, at Kitchener is, is leading pretty well, um, solidly with our climate action uh, plan. Where are we in relation to other communities? Are we sort of the middle of the pack? Are we leading edge? We, what would you say we are? Um, uh, in relation to the transportation emissions? Um, no, in relation, sorry, in relation to our progress and, and, and you know, where we've set some targets for 2020. Um, where would you say we, do you see us obtain, like getting there? Um, I, I definitely see that we can get there and I would say we're on par with many other municipalities who set their first um, short-term target, so a 10-year target. Since then, many municipalities have set a long-term target, which is part of the recommendation in front of you from staff, that we pursue looking towards those long-term targets. Great. Okay. Thanks so much for your answers, Danielle. I know that I sometimes come with a few tough questions, but thanks. No problem. Councilor Gazzola. Looking, looking at your charts, uh, how, how do you come up with these figures? For example, the, the, the real killer is transportation, where we've gone from two million to two million one. You know, had that stayed even, we would have had a reduction of seven and a half percent. So, how, how do you, how do you come up with those with those figures to start with? Where does that come from? So the methodology there um, for transportation specifically is based on the number of vehicles that are registered within Waterloo Region and a measurement of the number of kilometers traveled on roads within the community. So that's all it takes? It doesn't take into account the age of vehicles or what? Action. Actually, it does in those registration pieces. We do know the type of vehicle, um, which we can associate a fuel efficiency standard with. So where do we go to, to, get, to get that? Uh, well, first, uh, uh, what about, do we know what happened in 2016? Are we, or do we just look at this every five years? Do we have any idea of what we did in 2016? So we, we, do, we only do this measurement over, only every five years, that is correct. Um, we have a sense that this has been a trajectory for quite some time, um, and it's uncertain to know what's happened after 2015, but based on what we've seen as um, population grows, vehicle ownership has outpaced that growth, suggesting that people previously who got around with active or public transportation have no longer been able to do so or have chosen not to do so. Yeah. Okay, and this, these figures here are for the entire region, right? That is correct. Now, now the city of Kitchener are in those figures? That is correct. Are the city of Kitchener, the residents are, you know, what about the city of Kitchener itself? Were we, we uh, recently, did we not look at a, plan that we're going to reduce by 8% in a shorter period. Is that taken into account here? Or how does that get into these figures? So I'll share that the city of Kitchener would be counted in the workplaces um, okay. sector. Um, so the emissions of the city would be there. And if staff has anything to add about the relationship between community and corporate targets. No, but, no that's there. fine. I saw so workplaces are all uh, the different companies that are involved and, and, and they seem to be doing quite well, very well. So the, 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 it comes back to transportation. What, what should we be doing there? What can we do there to get that figure down? Can we outlaw drive-throughs, stuff like that? Should we be doing that? 
So changes to idling policies, which would yeah. consider drive uh, drive throughs may have an impact on transportation. I would suggest that active in public transportation and continuing to support the uptake of electric vehicles in our community for those who um, are not prepared to, to give up their, their personal vehicles might be some, some areas to look at. Do we, how do we push this? I mean, it would take, going to electric vehicles, that's expensive, very expensive. No, it's not? Oh, okay. I stand corrected. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Davey. Hi. Thanks, uh, Danielle, for your presentation. I just had one, uh, one question. I noticed in your, uh, your material here that the conversion to the LED street lighting was significant enough to warrant mention. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious if you're aware, and if not, how we make sure you find out that uh, Kitchener actually is implementing smart controls in addition. We're the only ones. And my understanding is, although a report's forthcoming, that we're going to be able to do some cool things like reduce the light output, you know, from midnight till four in the morning, and, and just basically overall reduce the amount of op output. And I understand it's actually um, significant in terms of the uh, the energy savings, which would in turn would mean it's significant in terms of the greenhouse gas reduction. So is that something that's, that's on your radar? Do you need to coordinate with staff when that report comes forward in terms of that calculation? Um, yes, it is coordinated with staff, and I believe uh, region-wide it's about 900 tons, and the city of Kitchener is somewhere in the magnitude of 500 tons of that. Um, staff could correct me if I'm incorrect there, but that's close. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, uh, so those are the questions of the committee. I have a few myself. Um, Councillor Fernandez touched on a couple questions, especially with the, the waste management and, and public transit for um, LRT. Um, how about as we look um, you know, over the horizon, it seems to be just over the horizon with rideshare mm -hmm. uh, technology, especially with autonomous vehicles. Um, as we factor that in, are we con would, would that play in part as a... Or you know, a requirement of uh, meeting our targets. Um, so rideshare certainly could have a contribution. Um, it could go both ways. So if um, um, so, ride sharing should reduce single occupancy vehicle trips. But the the other technology that's coming forward is autonomous vehicles. If everyone continues to own their own vehicle and autonomous vehicles drive around the city um, without um, necessarily parking or, or um, without having a passenger in them, that could have an impact um, on emissions in a negative way. Alternatively, the best solution would be that people share their vehicles um, and those vehicles are um, optimized to service areas that are not already um, serviced by public transit or for trips that don't make sense to do with public or active transportation. The reason why I bring this forward is I think we, as city planning, um, when it comes to development, when it comes to you know, meeting our climate action targets, we need to start considering the new technologies that are coming forward. And you, you reference of how this can have a positive negative impact. But again, if you have you know, more you know, with autonomous vehicles uh, and the ride-sharing kind of economy that will come with it, um, I guess not as much will be, room will be necessary for parking, which means more tree planting. So that all coincides with it. Are you guys doing some work as to calculating what that benefit would be uh, to municipalities? Um, we haven't done any work at this stage. That would be something that after a long-term target would be set, that we would work with our partners to investigate which kind of actions could help us achieve whatever long-term target the community directs us towards. Okay. And the other is um, towards our, um, our urban forests. Mm -hmm. um, so I see the chart here, uh, chart here with the challenge ahead. Uh, I don't see that, that as a component. You can reference in where it would fall in place perhaps in the residential side, uh, as we broaden our urban forest and continue to support it and sustain it, um, how, how, do we, how do we use that as a component of our achieving our targets? Mm -hmm. um, so as it stands right now, um, the planting of trees does sequester some carbon, but it doesn't reduce the carbon that we emit from our activities in our buildings, from energy use or our transportation footprint. And what we're looking to reduce is what we emit so that there's less need to capture that carbon in the atmosphere. Um, so in the scope of our targets as they are, that those activities wouldn't be captured. But the trees do take away the carbon from the atmosphere. 
they, they, they store it. That's correct. Right. So it is environmental positive benefit. It definitely does. So correct. isn't it, okay? That's that's fine. Um, it's just it would be good to to get some encouragement uh, out of you know uh, groups such as yourself because that's an endeavor that municipalities uh, try to achieve, and uh, we we need that encouragement. Uh, the the other is um, uh, for um, towards what the province is uh, you know um, the actions that they are taking, especially with uh, carbon credits and what that impact is on households with uh, increases to their, their gas utility bills. Um, and in some cases, that will be reduction in some consumption. Again, is that something you guys are factoring as well? or um, It's certainly pieces that we're looking for. And in the residential scope, we're um, turning to organizations like Reap Green Solutions that can help um, homeowners determine uh, changes they can make to their house to reduce their energy costs, to increase home comfort, and reduce their carbon footprint in, in light of that. Um, since August of last year, we've seen significant uptake of programs um, through Union Gas and Kitchener Utilities um, to re um, for homeowners to be eligible for up to $5,000 in incentives that would do exactly that, reduce their carbon footprint, reduce their energy bills, um, and increase home comfort. Okay. Uh, that's my questions. Uh, comments by the committee? Councillor Davey? Uh, thank you. Not really a comment. Thank just you, uh, I would uh, I'd like to ask for a recorded vote on this if it hasn't been asked for already. And I would offer my uh, unqualified support. I think it's uh, a no-brainer, and I look forward to a unanimous vote on this. Thank you. Danielle, that's all the questions for you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Ioannidis? Yeah, I just want to tip my hat off to you to your to you guys and uh like i remember when it's come a long long way since when mike came here I, maybe five six years ago or whatever uh and uh it was like three or four of you and and now you look at this and you see all the action items and everyone that's involved in the community it's just it's just mind-blowing and uh you know how exciting to have a net plus building that's being built, and even though it's not in our community, but but it's still in Waterloo Region, and that's uh, it's just fabulous. You guys are just do amazing things. Thank you, Council Fernandez. Thanks. So it has been quite a journey, and uh, as we look at where we are, our progress, and when we look at our transformation from the sustainable Waterloo Region, um, it this is exciting news. But I'm I'm guardedly optimistic only because when I look at this chart and I see 49% of what we have to change is our transportation, um, you know, I want, I'd, I'd love to know how many people would, could honestly say they reduced their car use at some point during the year. Um, are they willing to bike to do their errands? Are they willing to put one car away for the summer months and use alternative? I mean, it's harder in our, in our climate to, to change that modal shift uh, for many people because they like to be able to jump in the car and get their errands done and do whatever. But I, this is, I think, going to be our biggest challenge is, is changing that idea and how they're going to do it. Um, and even myself, I mean, I, I, I'm an avid cyclist, but I'm still a fair weather cyclist. Um, you know, do I need to push myself to leave my car and do more on my bike or get my husband to teach how to ride the scooter? That would be even better. Um, but, you know, I think we're, we're getting there. Um, our target, you know, from the environmental committee, I, I got the sense that we would have liked to have seen a higher target. But, Danielle, you're right. We, we, we do want to set a target that we can feel positive about that we can feel that we we can attain and um, and be successful uh, we don't want to pat ourselves on the back too much either I think we need to you know you guys are doing the hard work you're doing the pushing you're doing the let's get out there and let's make those changes um, the rest of us citizens counselors we need actually to do our, put our feet on the ground and get some, some of that hard work done as well. So thank you guys for being the impetus and the pushers behind some of this because I know it's hard work. It's hard work to get people to change. So um, I, I feel 
guardedly optimistic. I think we're going to get there. I'll be really interested to see where we're at in 2020 and, and, and what our readings are. So I'm, uh, I am enthusiastic about, of, of course, about passing this. Councillor, oh, sorry, my apologies, Mr. Mayor. It's okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Singh. Um, I, too, want to uh, pass on my thanks uh, to uh, the three of you uh, on behalf of uh, the whole group that's been working on this over the past number of uh, years. You know, when, when we started down this path five years ago, um, the reality is, you know, it was getting talked about a little bit in the community, but um, primarily because of external forces that were sort of raising awareness around it and, 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 and getting it to be talked about. Uh, obviously partially because of the work that you were doing. But now this is uh, a regular topic of discussion in our community. And I don't think we would be here today if it wasn't for um, the leadership that, that both your organizations have provide, provided in, uh, in getting us to, uh, to this point. Um, you know, we, we've certainly achieved some success, uh, but this is also a, a good reminder that uh, it's <clears throat> no time to... Uh, to sort of sit back and, and relax, uh, and that we're sort of well on the, the way to where we need to, to be. I think it's a reminder that uh, we probably need to uh, roll up our sleeves one extra time to make sure uh, we get to uh, where we want to be by, by 2020. Um, there's a lot changing around us that I think will, will help us get there, but we, uh, we do need to, to keep in mind um, where we are as a community and and uh, how we continue to, uh, to, to progress in this regard so that we meet our, our target, uh, partially because of the targets that we set for ourselves as a region, but partially because of the, the broader targets that have been um, set both uh, nationally and, and internationally in, in this regard that um, at least the Canadian part of North America continues to, to uh, still uh, espouse going forward. So, uh, so on behalf of all of us, a heartfelt thank you. Councillor Marsh. Uh, thank you. I, I too want to commend the team, our staff, and uh, the, the team from Sustainable Water Region on, on their work on this <clears throat> initiative. Uh, on a personal note, you know, uh, I, as a child, uh, smoking was a, a normal, uh, everyday occurrence, and yet within a generation, uh, or a generation and a half, uh, smoking is no longer the norm, and my kids don't even know what an ashtray is. And so I have hope that uh, habit changes can uh, take place in our community with regard to greenhouse gas emissions in a similar way. Uh, I know that <clears throat> uh, we have a lot of work to do, and, uh, and I think that we can look forward to more technological advances to help us to achieve our goals. Uh, with with our uh, uh, <clears throat> amazing uh, minds here in our in our region and beyond, I think that we can do it. Uh, I also want to just make note that I think it's it's uh, also important to, that our that our kitchen utilities initiatives uh, in to partner with the government of Ontario uh, to to give incentives to homeowners uh, is is uh, something worth, worthy of note as well, even if it's not captured in in this uh, lovely document. Thank you, Councillor Marsh. Uh, I'll quickly just make a couple of comments myself. Um, I, I just want to thank both of you for being here and presenting and giving us uh, a, you know, a quick look as to all the great work that, uh, as a community that we are doing already and some of the expectations that are laid out uh, of us. Uh, and I think that's, that's a good point. Uh, it's, uh, it's a bit of a roadmap for us to continue on carrying that path uh, of uh, our bettering our community uh, for not just ourselves, for our future generations. I think every order of government has a certain responsibility and we have to do our part at the local level. Uh, but also we have to acknowledge all um, the layers of certain um, you know, initiatives that are already um, being taking place, like what uh, Councillor Davey had mentioned with our streetlight initiative. Um, aspect of our tree planting, uh, of uh, strong uh, support of our urban forests, um, with our transit locally, uh, the great work that's taking place and what will be transformational for our community, and as well as things that will come on their own with the change of technologies and uh, using that as part of our planning 
uh, basis that uh, um, has a certain context to sustainability and the environment. So um, thank you for all the great work that your organizations are doing and uh, I, I think the, the targets that are laid out are achievable and uh, I think we can strive for better. So with that, uh, I think um, Councillor Fernandez wants a recorded vote. Um, so wait for the call when you're ready. Please vote. All those in oh. That is unanimous. Thank you, everyone, and thank you again for being here. We'll get on to the, uh, the next item, which is uh, the uh, large undertaking of the uh, comprehensive review of the zoning bylaw, new zoning bylaw for compre component E, first draft of the residential zones. There is a brief um, presentation by staff. Uh, Natalie, uh, whenever you're ready, you can make the presentation. Just key in and I'll activate your mic. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. Thank you. We are excited to be here today to provide the highlights of the first draft of Component E of the city's proposed new zoning bylaw. Since March of 2015, different zones and sections have been tabled through Component A through D, and today we are here to bring forward the final component, Component E, our residential zones. The draft residential zones consolidate the nine existing R zones into seven proposed res zones to implement the low-rise residential, medium-rise residential, and high-rise residential land use designations of the city's new official plan. These zones can be applied to urban and suburban areas. The zones range in permitted dwelling types and lot sizes from those that accommodate limited dwelling types on larger lot sizes, such as the state lots, to those that provide for a broad range of dwelling types and complementary non-residential uses on a wide range of lot sizes, including smaller suburban greenfield lots. Terminology and regulations related to duplexes, garden suites, and coach houses have also been updated to reflect updates to provincial legislation. This includes allowing for a single detached or single dwelling unit, a second dwelling unit, what we know as duplexes within single detached, semi detached, and street house, townhouse dwellings subject to regulations, and allowing for a secondary dwelling, what we know as garden suites and coach houses, in a detached building on a lot with a single detached, semi detached, or street townhouse dwelling, again subject to regulations. Earlier this year, Council endorsed REENS, the Residential Intensification and Established Neighborhood Study. As a result of recommendations from this study, the first draft includes regulations pertaining to front and exterior side yard setbacks based on the average setback of the two neighboring properties and allowing for a tolerance of one to two meters from the average setback um, has been incorporated in the draft to allow for some flexibility. Uh, a maximum building height restricted to nine meters or two stories in certain geographies and these geographies will be determined through further analysis. No projecting garages within this Rien's area, and depending on the predominant character of specific areas, additional regulations may apply to require no garages, require detached garages to locate in the rear yard, require garages to be set back from the front face of the building. Staff will also be doing further review and analysis of existing R6 and R7 properties to consider the appropriate zoning. Council, Council also endorsed the neighborhood strategy earlier this year, which contained two action items that have been incorporated into the first draft. The first is inviting front porches. The draft includes a minimum depth for all new porches in order to improve their functionality. And the second is community space in multiple dwellings. The draft proposes to allow community facilities, such as community centers and libraries, to be permitted as part of larger multiple dwellings. Staff. Sorry. Staff has also proposed changes to the driveway and garage regulations as part of this first draft. The proposed regulations are based on four principles. Providing space on private properties for residents to park vehicles. Creating a streetscape that encourages pedestrian activity and safety. Creating a boulevard space that can accommodate street trees, snow storage, and infrastructure utilities. 
and providing appropriate spaces on street for vehicle parking. To balance achieving these principles, the draft regulations provide for a maximum driveway and garage width that is tied to the width of the lot, only allowing for garage projections beyond the building facade to a maximum amount where a porch is provided along the same facade. So these are the key highlights of component E. The next step in the process is to consult with the property owners and begin applying this residential zoning. There are approximately 50,000 properties in the city that are going to be zoned residential. As such, staff has developed a framework for applying the residential zoning on a ward-by-ward -ward basis over the next couple years. The framework and timing of consultation prioritizes the implementation of new and updated land use and zoning framework for our parts areas, our planning around rapid transit station areas, and our reends area. Staff will kick off the public consultation at a drop-off session in June, on June 21st, and as part of the consultation, staff will also be hosting one-on-one -on -one interviews from June to August, meeting with the Waterloo Region Home Builders Association, Kitchener Lee's Liaison Committee, at several sessions throughout 2017, and conducting neighborhood-specific consultation with property owners and neighborhood associations beginning in the fall of 2017. We will continue to inform of the process through notification to property owners, ads in the record, and Kitchener Post, and inform information on our project website. So that concludes our presentation. Are there any questions of staff? There are. Councillor Janetsky, when you're ready. Yes, thank you very much, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to move the, uh, the recommendation by staff at the appropriate time, or even right now. Um, the process that you've been going through is, is uh, an, another step in the whole zoning bylaw review, which, which, which is uh, basically needed, as I see it. And staff are uh, uh, doing a great job. It's very detailed and very complex, and I'm totally familiar with what, what you have to go through. We have nine residential zones right now, and we are reducing it down to seven. Which of the two zones that we have right now are the ones that are more or less being eliminated that you would see? I'm sorry, Ned. Being collapsed Just that you're probably familiar with are the R1 and the R2 zones. Um, those are the larger estate lots. Yeah. Um, although they've been collapsed, we do have some additional regulations for that zone that if you are unserviced, you do have to be a larger lot area and larger lot width, which is similar to the current R1 zone. And then the other one that we're merging is the R6 and R7 zone. Sorry, correction, R7 and R8. And that's, uh, those currently implement our, like our medium rise residential designation. And through our analysis, we thought, saw it fit to be able to merge those two as they were very similar in terms of permitted uses, lot area and lot width. Yeah, those are the two high-density ones. I mean, you still got another higher one, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I can see the higher ones be, uh, come together. So, uh, no, that's that's fine. Uh, go forward with uh, the uh, meeting with the uh, community and uh, gather all your information. I see all the details on the appendices that you've provided, and all the little <laughs> detail setbacks and requirements and regs, uh, which is which is just part of the job. So it's a matter of let's see what the neighborhood says on that. So, good job, Sarah. Do you want to just keep your mic on? Will be yeah. There'll be more questions coming your way. Councillor Galloway, see you uh, Yeah, understanding that this is a zoning review, I'm not sure if some of my input is, if this is the right stage for it. So just if it's not, then let me know. Um, obviously, I have a subdivision that has zero lot lines. Is that something that would be looked at here and removing that as an option in our city? Um, through the chair, that is something that we did look at, and it's something we are proposing to remove as part of this draft. Okay great because it creates a lot of headaches and nightmares um, and my other question uh, is with regards to the width of driveways um, I know that we were we have a certain percentage or the size of the garage is that something that we're looking at through this as well um, to the chair it is and I'm actually going to direct you to Lauren who's uh, was more involved in drafting those regulations to answer sure through the chair, the garage and the driveway regulations that have been proposed through this first draft are, have been developed based on a different set of principles. And so, as was mentioned in the presentation, some of those have to do with concerns that we've heard about on-street parking, about snow storage and street, uh, street trees, as well as having sort of vibrant streetscapes. So basically what's been happening is with these new proposed regulations, 
the intent is that the width of a driveway or the width of a garage would be tied to the width of a lot, and that's to help balance some of those other concerns that we've heard. And then through this process, we'll be going and consulting with the public and with stakeholders to make sure that we understand the full implications of that. So having said all that, is it going to be easier for people to have wider driveways or is it going to be around the same? I just know in the area I represent, a lot of people are, are widening their driveways um, because of, out of necessity for the most part. Uh, is that kind of the direction that we're headed in? So the intent is that it would depend on the size of the lot of, right. of the property. So on smaller lots, it would uh, in, the intent is that it would be more difficult to have a wider driveway, and that's to make sure that there are some of those other principles are being maintained. Yeah, see, and that's where I probably have the, the problem. So um, I think that's something that we I can appreciate that you, you want to try and balance, but um, that's where a lot of our concerns end up coming. So I think that that's one point that we may want to look at, that you know, um, a, a lot size that's maybe 50 feet wide may be able to be under one principle, but then there's a lot that's 30 feet that may not be able to have the same percentage or principle applied to it. Um, just it's necessity and the parking and a lot of the other regulations. So um, that's something that I would like to see um, highlighted and maybe looked at. Um, and then when it comes to front porches, as I was reading, um, I'm in favor of front porches. You actually had um, a picture up there, uh, and I think I read it right, and the one was on Maitland, um, the top right there. Um, is that the type of, or is that the sizing, or are we intending on increasing the size of front porch? I, I know this area well and, and a lot of the new homes. Uh, is that the intent to have that size or try and increase size of front porches? Through the chair, so one of the goals here was about having a usable front porch, which comes from some of the recommendations from the REN study. And so we've tried to incorporate that into these draft regulations and have a proposed minimum width of the uh, front porch of 1.5 meters to kind of get at that usability in the space there. So when you say that usability is like a matter of having one one chair, does that make it like usable? I'm just trying to get a sense of where we're trying to go and what we're trying to achieve. Through the chair, there was a lot of discussion that we had as staff internally about how how do you regulate usability and how do you provide enough flexibility that allows people to develop a porch that works for them in different geographic contexts in the city. Uh, what we were comfortable with at this point is just regulating the depth of the porch, which is the one and a half meters, and that's enough to generally get a bistro table set, so a table and two chairs. Um, it's just a minimum requirement, so if they want to go deeper or bigger, provided they meet setback regulations, then that, that, would, that would be okay with from a bylaw perspective. As we started looking at specific geographic areas of the city, we realized that there's a very large range of porch sizes and if we started getting at an actual area of porch it may actually create a lot of legal, legal non-complying situations throughout the city and we're trying to minimize that to a certain degree as we go forward with a new bylaw. So would you say then the picture on the top right would be close to what a minimum porch would be ish? Through the chair generally speaking yes. Okay. Um, I think that is all my questions um, and you said that um, the the zero lot lines already part of this document great thank you Councilor Fernandez thank you so I have a few questions um, related to this uh, <clears throat> on page 2-5 you're talking about um, uh, application of residential zones on updated land use and heritage so what are we changing or are we changing anything related to heritage? Through the chair, the reference to heritage in the staff report was meant to get at the implementation of the cultural heritage landscapes study that we completed a couple of years ago. And it's looking at those recommendations and how to best implement that through either zoning or other mechanisms. Okay, all right, that's, that's good news. I'm glad to hear, I mean, I know that you, you referenced that, but you also referenced um, wards 3, 9, and 10, and I'm thinking cultural heritage landscapes um, are in, in Ward 4, too, in, in 
some, some significant areas, which has been some of the challenges with the zoning around there and people wanting to buy the larger lots, knocking down the, the older homes and building something significantly bigger. Um, <clears throat> on, um, on, I, on page 2-7, there's some, you're talking about consultation. So, I mean, I attended the uh, first consultation round that we had around the natural um, not, not, not natural spaces. Natalie, you can pro correct me on what that was called. When, what the open spaces. And, natural Heritage Conservation right, Zone. Right, right. Um, that, was, that was quite an undertaking for staff and, and, and quite concerning for residents. I'm seeing here that you're going to be doing some one-on-one. -on -one. Is that one-on-one -on -one with the larger stakeholders or one-on-one -on -one with um, a resident who might say, oh, wait a minute, you're changing my zone? So through the chair, it can be either. And as we've experienced over the last couple of years of consultation, um, stakeholder sessions typically occur with more uh, interest groups. But as we notify property owners, we're open to having individual conversations with property owners about their specific properties as well. Okay, okay, that's good. So on the, one of the pictures you had showed um, a community facility um, in multiple dwellings. Um, I mean, that's certainly the way of many European countries, and, and I, I really embrace that. I think that, that having residents live in the, in the upper stories and having community, fit, whether it's a doctor's offices or, or um, you know, a small store or even a community center kind of idea in, in the lower levels, the challenge would be, I think, in the parking um, because I'm, I'm wondering how you're, so you're, ch you're shifting a zone, you're shifting a zone designation because now you're using multiple uses, right? You're using residential with commercial or residential with institutional. Have you looked further into how that would play out with parking? So through the chair, through what we tabled last year in our new parking regulations, there's the ability to do shared parking amongst uh, residential uses, institutional uses, office type uses, and community facilities. So that's definitely a possibility to try to reduce the number of parking spaces that would be required. As well, we have reduced our parking rates, minimum parking rates, um, quite substantially across the board for many uses. Right. Good. I was hoping you were going to say that because that, that was one of the things I was thinking. When the residents are gone to work, you've got all that empty space that you can use. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about the, um, the driveway and, regu and garage regulations. Um, of course, you know, we, we have an ongoing concern in the Lower Dune area with student housing. Uh, I know that there's been some uh, pressure from the landlords to, do, to, to review the zoning that's in that, that the inter, it's not interim, but it is a bylaw uh, against duplexing. Uh, those are those conversations you expect you will be having with some landlords? Have you reached out to them yet? Through the chair, when we do the specific zoning in that area, yes, we'll reach out to landlords and other interest groups in that particular area to talk through any issues that are zoning related yeah, through okay. this process. I mean, and uh, unlike the uh, previous councillors speaking about widening uh, driveways, that's one of the last things we want to do really in, in that area. Will we be um, area specific then when it comes to, to that or... You know, I don't, I don't, we don't want to see widening of driveways so you've got four or five cars parked in a driveway um, and stacked in front and behind it when it comes to student housing. Is that going to be area specific in how you zone those? So through the chair, what we're proposing at this point is a base rule with respect to driveways and garage widths. We know that what we're tabling in the first draft is going to get a reaction from many interest groups, and that's fine. It's just a first draft. That's why we put it out there, and we, we kind of test the waters and see what happens. If we need to uh, modify those base rules to be geographic-specific, that's definitely something we can explore over the next couple of years. Or if the base rule needs to change, we can, we can look at that as well. We need to put something out there to get people to react sure. to something. Yeah. Okay. Um, my time is up. I do have another question. I'm not sure. Of course. Okay. Councillor for Etherington. Through you, Mr. Chair, a couple of questions to start. I wanted to ask about the timing 
of what you're proposing in different areas. Like, what governs the timing? Is it because you're expecting fast development in some of those areas? Through the chair, the timing of the consultation that we have put forward as part of this report was generally based on the principle of implementing recommendations from the parts studies and the REN study as well as priority areas to update the zoning framework and land use framework. Um, aside from that, um, we looked at the number of properties that are designated uh, residential in the balance of the wards, and they ranged between five to 7,000 properties in each. So at that point, it was you know, kind of packaging up the balance of the wards and saying that we'll get to them post uh, sometime in the winter of 2019. So it's balancing the number of properties that we would have to look at site-specific zoning for together with the priorities of, of updating a zoning framework in areas where um, there may be a little bit more of a need to have zoning in place a little bit quicker. Yeah, all of my questions, as usual, are selfish ward questions. That's why I asked. I noticed the dark green on your map would be probably the Victoria Park area leading up towards Cedar Hill area. So that'll be the first one you'll be looking at. That's why I asked that question. But it has no other reason other than number of properties in those areas. Through the chair, the, the consultation that will be commencing in the fall, yes, is um, Victoria Park secondary plan area, uh, Civic Center secondary plan area, and the Cedar Hill secondary plan area. And those were prioritized because council endorsed a part central plan in the spring of last year. And we wanted to get on implementing uh, those recommendations that came out of, out of that study since it is complete already. And again, excuse my ignorance of planning detail, but I have uh, a couple of heritage areas in my uh, ward. People are already asking me, well, will it affect the maximum height of houses on our street? Can you say that at the moment? Can you calm those fears or not? So through the chair, if there are properties that are designated or listed heritage or they're part of a heritage conservation district, we look at those plans as we're developing, implementing zoning, and whether we need to implement any regulations specifically in zoning that would apply to those areas or geographies would be explored through the, this timing that we're proposing. Okay. So I can't really calm their fears then. There will be ample opportunity for them to participate in a process over the next 18 to 24 months, and we will continue along with our notification in some way to ensure that specific property owners are aware of changes that are happening on their property. The one example, I think I've run out of time. Yes, no? The one example I keep coming back to in several of my residential areas Again, where people raise concerns, there's a lot of uh, property speculation going on in these areas. If someone buys two or three houses in a, an established residential, sometimes heritage neighborhood, are they now able to come to you or will they be able to come to you and say, I want to put up, a, like, put these properties together and put up a low-rise, mid-rise apartment building. That's the kind of concerns I run So th through the chair, there's a couple of things that we're trying to do uh, with a comprehensive look at a new zoning bylaw is to try to establish uh, a general idea of what the rules would be up front so that um, property owners are aware of what can happen in their neighborhood, but it also provides a general set of rules for uh, those wishing to develop properties. Um, so it puts the rules up front in a more transparent way. Um, that being said, the uh, provincial legislation does provide the ability to make development applications, so whether that's a site plan or a rezoning application at any time, and we consider those on their own merits as they're submitted. Nothing specific. No. Um, that does take up your time, Councillor Arlington, if you want okay, to ring back in. Okay, I'll kick yeah. back in. Thank you. I, was, if I forgot to ring you in for the time, so I gave, it was a little gracious, so... I think you had already gone over five minutes, but you can ring back in. <laughs> 
please bring back in Councilor Marsh. Thank you. <clears throat> so just a couple questions. I'm wondering, are we going to have an opportunity within this term of council to approve some of the uh, some of the areas of Kitchener uh, residential zoning uh, or, or no? So through the chair, what we've committed to is tabling a final draft bylaw at a statutory public meeting in the spring of 2018. After that, we would like to have further conversations with you about the desire to make an actual decision on the whole bylaw, parts of the bylaw, or, or what you'd like to do after we, we go to a statutory public meeting next year. Okay. And because you're not going to get to the public consultation uh, for a lot of the parts of the city until after this term of council is over. So Through the chair, that would be correct based on the application of the zones. So there's several options that, that we're kind of talking about internally that we can continue to talk about Great. Uh, for the balance of this year. But yes, there, there are options that a bylaw could be decided upon and not applied to all properties. Um, there are options where you could um, defer a decision on residential zones, um, but those are things that we should continue to talk about and see you know, how far we, we want to go with a zoning bylaw in this term of council. Okay, thanks. Um, another question I have is just around, will, we be, will there be an opportunity within this review of the bylaw, the residential bylaws, to include things like um, allowing more flexibility when uh, a neighborhood urban market um, wants, to, wants to be able to uh, take place in a neighborhood, that type of thing, and or let's say um, a bakery or a cafe um, <clears throat> in a residential zone, would, would that require rezoning uh, applications or would that, can we find a way to incorporate that type of thing in, our, in this review? Through the chair, together with the uh, tabling of the previous component, component D of Crosby. So together with the tabling of component D of Crosby, we did introduce some new draft regulations for temporary farmers markets and community gardens, permitting them in a wide range of zones. So those are out there and are being consulted on currently. Okay, and sorry, when are those, when is D uh, going to be decided on? So the timing of all of that would have to do with when we have the full final bylaw together for a decision with council. So yeah, so we've been waiting, I think, since before this term of council for the bylaw review, and now it's it's going to take more than four years. And Councilor and Marsh, we, I think we want to be. I'm trying to understand. Focus on the germane of why? what we're talking about the residential. Okay, I appreciate that. I, 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 it's just new to me, so that's fine. Uh, I just so then. Um, so temporary market gardens, that, or temporary markets, that's one thing, but um, will there be an opportunity for uh, us to include flexibility within a residential zoning area if, if uh, somebody wanted to uh, do some mixed use, uh, make an, a mixed use application rather than just pure residential in a whole neighborhood? Um, through the chair, that's some of the changes we proposed as part of the new residential zoning. In the more dense residential zones, we pro uh, proposed to add um, some more no uh, complementary resident non-residential uses. So those include, uh, we have community retail, artisan's establishment, uh, community facility, which I mentioned previously, daycare facility, financial establishment, health office, uh, personal services and studio. So those, some of those already exist, but a, a wide range of those are supposed to be added. And that's the direction from the new official plan. Okay, thank you. Mayor Van Vick. Thank you very much. And I just really wanted to touch on um, the, the multiples that, um, that you were talking about. And I know Councilor Fernandez referenced it in her questions as well, and sort of looking at that amenity space and and so on. And you know, as you as you get into neighborhoods, um, particularly in in Europe and so on, it is much more widespread. And I think you know, to the presentation we had just prior to you around sustainability and so on. I mean, it means you know, creating more walkable neighborhoods, but it means people need to change their their attitudes. Uh, around you know having a, a corner store in their neighborhood again or uh, around having a, a little cafe in their neighborhood and and so on 
uh, are we just going to explore this in the context of um, multiples, or are we going to explore it in the context of um, you know some of the, the the streets that are on the on the fringes of, of neighborhoods, uh, but for example, are on bus routes or on the arterials or collectors, and so on as as a possibility of something to look into if we if we're truly trying to get into more walkable neighborhoods. But it but I get that you know this would mean bringing the community along with it as well. Through the chair, or sorry, the mayor, um, that is something we considered when we were looking at our commercial zoning that we tabled in April. Uh, so we revised our local commercial zones, again, to allow a wider range of commercial areas. And these, uh, these zones would be within our more residential uh, areas. So kind of like you mentioned, the corner store, uh, we would be zoning some of these lots, our commercial one zone, that would allow for those type of uses to service the local area. And the intention is that people could walk to it rather than having to drive, kind of have that complete uh, healthy community that we're striving for. Okay, great. Maybe at some point I'll sit down with you guys and sort of just to better uh, understand how they're all interrelating with each other because I think it's um, it, it's going to require significant dialogue with the community as we potentially move into some of those directions. Thank you. Uh, before I go back to the second round of questions, I had some of mine. Um, uh, I'm glad that uh, Councillor... Um, Galway Sea Lock touched on uh, aspect of dryway ratios. Uh, I think we have to get that uh, the balance right, especially if residents are having to retrofit afterwards or adding in pathways in the context of it's really going to be for the purpose of a, a driveway. We need to ensure that there is a flexibility um, so we, we can meet the needs uh, of our changing demographic of our community. So uh, what that right mix is, I'll leave it to you guys as part of the consultation. The, the other is uh, for amenity space, uh, I think that's, that's, that's great. We, there needs to be more encouragement in multi-level uh, for a mixed use uh, capacity. And that is, uh, I think, aspect of you know, a more walkable community, right? So um, the other question I had was uh, in regards to infill. Uh, we set certain infill targets. Uh, when we approach a residential, you know, for the comprehensive review, do we look in the context of what our targets are for uh, infill development so that we can, you know, not necessarily discourage, but make an alternative market for, um, for, for growth as opposed to suburban growth? So one thing that we can do through zoning is generally our intensification is focused in our intensification areas, so downtown nodes, corridors, and along the LRT. But with that, we know that you know in, in our parts areas or in um, our more stable residential neighborhoods that there is a desire to some, sometimes do uh, certain forms of intensification. What we're trying to do through zoning is build in some of those rules that if it's going to happen, it happens in a way that, um, you know, maintains the character of those neighborhoods, which is, you know, part of what you endorsed through the re study. So we're, we're incorporating that type of thing. Part of it is um, doing this type of, you know, gentle uh, densification. And that's why uh, we're opening up the rules a little bit with respect to second and secondary dwelling units to be able to locate on a lot. Um, so that, that would provide for a type of intensification in neighborhoods um, that may be an increase by one unit, but it wouldn't be you know, a drastic change from the neighborhood perspective. Yeah. Now, the reason why I ask is, I, and I can appreciate, we, even just my colleagues here, we don't all see development out of the same lens. Um, we, um, you know, some approaches, of course, if you, if you want to, um, you know, not encourage uh, our city growing outward uh, and, and the outer limits, we have to be flexible with uh, certain infill guidelines. And the, the reason why I ask is when we look at a full city-wide comprehensive review for the residential uh, zoning, um, I know that we already are looking at that in certain nodes, but again, in our neighborhoods, we have already infrastructure and amenities that are sought for. Um, and there needs to be equitability in development across the city in that, in that capacity, as long as it, it conforms to, uh, you know, conf you know, to uh, character of a neighborhood. 
So are we going to be looking for that feedback uh, as part of a, I guess, the Ryan study, but more of uh, in the context of the review, the comprehensive review? So yes, I think as we get in these neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods that are governed by existing secondary plans, um, it, that's something we can definitely look at as we go through the land use designations and then look at site-specific zoning. Part of the review that Sarah had mentioned earlier about the review of existing R6 and R7 zoned sites, which is generally the higher end of a low-rise residential designation and the lower end of a medium-rise residential designation is looking at those and evaluating whether that is the appropriate type of density in those particular neighborhoods. Um, there's a couple of other things that we did build into the base zoning. One is that um, you can have an increased building height. So you can go up to four stories um, in a residential zone if you're on a major road, so an arterial or collector road. That's one way of getting a little bit more density, but on the edges of, of neighborhoods, not necessarily in neighborhoods. And then the second, secondary dwelling units as well. Okay, good, thank you. I'll go to the second set of questions, Council Fernandez. Um, so you may have already um, indicated why you've got some of the blue zoning deferred post-2018, so of course, specifically Ward 4, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in Ward 3, some of that blue, would that be around Hidden Valley? Through the chair, yes, it is. Okay. And the, the rationale for not um, doing anything on the zoning in Ward 4 yet is because... So through the chair, the blue areas in Ward 4 um, are deferred uh, pending additional land use review. So Upper and Lower Dune are going to be going through a specific study in that area um, where we'll look at the land use and the zoning at the same time as any heritage characteristics and things like that um, together with you know, the student housing um, issue and Conestoga College master plan and all of that all at the same time. Um, other areas uh, in Ward 4, actually there's not that much, but some of the stuff as we get into Ward 5 are areas that are new urban areas that we need to go through a land use review before we can apply new, new zoning in that area. Okay. Um, so just a quick question on the uh, coach house and garden suites. Um, we don't see that very often, do we? I mean, it, it, would it be more in the older established neighborhoods that we have these coach houses and garden suites? Or is that something that we might see people want to add on or what they used to call granny suites? Is that so through the chair, the rules right now from a zoning perspective on coach houses is, um, I'm just going on memory here, but from what I recall, as it's limited to um, existing coach houses uh, prior to 1994. So the rules are quite restrictive with respect to a detached second unit, say in your backyard. Um, basically, it has to be a building that existed or the coach house itself that existed prior to 1994. The shift in the new proposed regulations um, is stemming from provincial direction, which is mandating us to kind of open it up um, and broaden and be a little bit more um, permissive with respect to that type of use. Do you see that as, um, I mean, you might, <laughs> I'm asking a question for you to understand why the province would have done something like that, but um, is that because they're seeing the aging population may want to stay within their own housing, like we're, you know, uh, like I'm saying, a granny suite ba built in uh, their child's backyard kind of thing so that they can age at home. So through the chair, I think that's part of it. I think also it's to get at um, this type of gentle intensification in established neighborhoods as well. Um, and it's also to, in part, address the issue of housing affordability. So to provide, you know, maybe a rental supplement to, um, for property owners. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councillor Etherington. Through you again, Mr. Chair. Uh, could I ask staff, um, especially with the June 21st meeting, how are you going to promote that meeting? And could I also ask, because I think it should be promoted extensively, and the second part of that question, whenever there is a ward-specific meeting on this subject, could you please notify councillors in advance? So those are the easy questions. Through the chair, yes, the easy answer is yes, of course. 
We will do that. The June 21st meeting, it's important to know that that's just to kick off or launch the consultation on residential. We fully expect to have, at a minimum, one type of consultation session in each ward. So at a minimum, that's 10, plus probably more than that. So you can see why it's going to take us the better part of you know 18 to 24 months to kind of roll this out and have uh, what we find are very valuable conversations with property owners and developers through the process. Yeah, we sometimes make the assumption that people automatically know because it's online. I still meet a lot of people who don't know because they're not familiar with, you know, they still read the paper or whatever they do. So through the chair, we do the standard, which is advertise in the record, as well as advertise in the Kitchener Post and promote through social media. The other thing that we are doing that no other municipality is doing in our region is sending individualized letters to each property owner when we do uh, update their zoning. We do have to talk about that a bit more given that the residential zoning will impact 50,000 plus properties and you know balancing that with you know resourcing and things like that but it is our intent to get a little bit more specific in terms of notification when you're talking about modifying rules on specific properties. Okay, thank you. Uh, my last question. Uh, when we approved the RIENS report, we also in, re, we introduced the word flexible. And I know I was screaming at your people about that. I've calmed down since. But uh, the word flexible, can you tell me what you mean by that and why that was there? I think as Sarah mentioned in the presentation, my understanding through the conversations um, around this table with respect to that study was there was some concern that uh, from the front yard setback perspective that if we just attached it to your two neighbors that, that uh, we didn't want to stagnate development or um, we didn't want to make things look exactly the same in these neighborhoods so we wanted to provide some flexibility. So what we were directed to do is look at more than just, you know, turn to your left, turn to your right, and see how far those properties are set back. We wanted to build in what we're calling some sort of a tolerance. So you look to your neighbors and you find out what their average setback is, and then generally your build to area is one meter ahead of that average or two meters behind. So it still provides some consistency, but some variety in terms of a building setback on the street. That's what we were getting at with flexibility. Nothing to do with height. Uh, the height um, in terms of a zoning regulation generally is going to be around 11 meters for uh, the residential type of zones, the street oriented type of dwelling units. In certain areas, what the RIENs told us to look at is in areas that are predominantly bungalows to examine those areas more specifically and determine whether there would be a benefit to reducing that maximum building height to two stories. Thank you. All right, those are all the questions of staff. I w it had moved by Councillor um, Fernandez. Oh, I'm sorry, my apologies. Yes, you did, you did ask for it. Okay, moved by Councillor Janetsky. Um, I see no comments. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Thank you, and uh, that concludes our Planning and Strategic Initiatives Committee.